Hello, hello, I'm Looney, this is r slash game tales, and this is the story of Ogi, the honorary dwarf. Let me regale you with the tale of my party's beloved Ogi, honorary dwarf. Our party consisted of good friends that had known each other. I reformed that guy, Lucas the veteran. We had a pretty decent group, consisting of a dwarf warrior, human paladin, human warlock, tiefling rogue, me playing half-elf ranger, and a human mage. We were in the relatively early stages of an epic campaign and had been greeted by a sudden surge of slightly stronger enemies. What made these enemies slightly sturdier? Well, according to our DM, they had been gifted with what could only be described as slapdash metal riveted together by clumsy hands. This led us to a few leads in town that accumulated in hearing of an ogre that had taken up residence in an abandoned forge and begun crafting rudimentary armored weapons for the local minions, and of course this led to our first quest, kill the ogre, stop the attacks. After what felt like an hour of minion stopping quest cruising, we found the forge and killed a few of the outlying minions to prevent an unwelcome intrusion with the upcoming boss fight. We prepared ourselves, no cleric had to be especially careful with potion rations, added some fun to the game, and had the tiefling sneak in to make sure we could sneak up without any trouble, or annoying traps going off. She gave us the all clear. We shuffled inside, praying our sneak checks held up. Inside the large forge, we followed the sound of clinging metal and deep grunts. Lucas took the lead, preparing to call in a few favors from Bahamut, with Raj the dwarf following close behind him. We turned the corner. The DM informed us that we saw a large shape moving around the anvil and smelter, which we all knew meant the ogre. I asked to roll for initiative, to sneak in a shot, and perhaps swing the battle to our favor. But Lucas had another plan. Lucas rolls for a diplomacy check and takes the lead by speaking with the ogre. Why are you making armor for evil? The ogre stopped and turned around in surprise. The DM apparently was surprised if he didn't flat out attack and asked us for a moment to pin something down. After his pen stopped, he cleared his throat. Make armor here. Ogres no like make armor, so make armor for gobgobs. They like. The ogre then went on to tell us about how he discovered a book about crafting and decided to try making some himself. Judging from the simplicity of the story, our DM hadn't expected us to be diplomatic and just threw together something to explain why an ogre would want to spend his time with a hammer and anvil instead of hunting down adventurers and eating goats. As the story dragged on and we learned that the ogre had been kicked out for finding a book from another culture, we slowly kinda silently agreed to avoid killing him since the image of this 9 foot tall ogre tinkering away at an anvil to make a small medium sized armor was too funny to pass up. When the ogre got to the part where he revealed he couldn't read the book, which was a dwarven guide apparently, and was just following the pictures, Lucas decided to chime in. Why don't you come with us? We have a dwarf who can translate the book for you, and you can learn to make better armor. The DM looked a little confused, but decided that the ogre could be allowed to be a friendly NPC in the party if we all allowed it, and thus we were joined by Ogi, the crafting ogre. First thing we did once we went into town was calm the mob that had appeared and attempted to kill Ogi. Five diplomacy checks, a bluff check, and almost a third of my gold later, the town relents and let us stay with them for the night. Ogi was really excited by this prospect and asked if he could visit the blacksmith, which Lucas had to explain was probably not a good idea since there wasn't a room in town big enough to hold him. We told Ogi to sleep in the stables. Ogi understand. Ogi try not to make homies mad. That night, before ending the session, we joked about how silly this all was. Taking in an ogre that didn't want to fight? We told some jokes, made a few jabs at how we thought the ogre was going to bite the dust, and we called it a session. Next session, we woke up, paid for food until the next town, and left the inn, picking up Ogi from the stables on the way out. During the journey, Ogi kept bothering Raj the dwarf and asking about crafty smiths and clang clang tools. Now Raj is my dude bro, I've known for years, and even though this is obviously bothering him answering every question, he at least tries to be nice to the insistent pestering. In hindsight, this was probably our DM's attempt to leave Ogi behind so he could get back to the focus, but we managed to persist and kept him with us to the next town. This time deciding that we cannot afford to argue Ogi into every town and spend half our income, being a ranger, I offered to set up camp just outside the town's borders. That we can keep Ogi and hunt some pelts for extra income. Raj offers to stay in camp with me and Ogi, with Lucas heading into town for the temple and the rogue wizard and warlock will search for quests. As we set up the tents, I ask if it's possible to use Ogi as a deterrent against mobs in the local area. 
The DM allows a roll, and with the 17, says that Ogi's natural musk alerts the other monsters in the area to stay away. Raj stayed behind as I picked off some local wildlife for our dinner. While I hunted, Ogi asked Raj more questions about the book. How Ogi make? You can't. That needs a bar of iron in a forge. Ogi make forge? I uh, don't think there's enough materials around here to do that. The wizard returned to our camp, letting the rogue and warlock threaten a local mayor for a better reward. The wizard proposed he make a temporary forge for Ogi, using some spells in his fire magic. As for iron, the group has a bag of holding full of old weapons we had earned from defeating a minor demon. Ogi, who was ecstatic at the idea, asked if he could make some armor for his dwarvy friend who read Ogi book. Not seeing harm in such an idea, we agreed, and Ogi set to work. In the morning when we had awoken, Lucas, the rogue, and the warlock also returned to camp. After we explained the plan for the newest quest, we gathered up our things and decided to wake Ogi. Turns out the poor bastard had spent half the night banging away at the old pile of scrap and made a chess piece, aptly titled by the DM as Ogi's Chess Piece of Protect, which was described as a hodgepodge of metal sheets roughly slapped together. Raj, being such a dude bro, offered to wear it despite having one less protection against Slash. As the DM described Ogi's dumb, smiling face, I felt a pang of guilt for making fun of him. Mini quest continued on with Ogi, the crafting ogre, who had the neat ability to craft a piece of armor or weapon every 1d4 nights, and the DM would use 2d20s to determine the item he crafted. About two months of an in-game time passed, and Ogi had made us some slightly less than useful items with no sign of improving. Sometimes we'd sell the things he'd make, other times we wore them for Ogi, just to make him happy. By the fifth quest I had an Ogi's worsty gird gloves. When we finally located one of the main storyline quests, we also happened to pass by a temple of Morden, which had two dozen forges surrounding it for his followers to craft weapons for paladins. It was like trying to hold a nine foot tile child back from a toy store. Ogi two crafty smiths. Maybe one teach Ogi make better armor. Best not thrush them, Ogi. Raj said rolling for a diplomacy check to calm Ogi down. But Ogi won't make better armor for friends. That hit us hard, and Lucas being the de facto head took the lead. Ogi, you can't enter the forges. They're only for Morden's craftsmen. What mean? Only dwarves are allowed in. Ogi seemed a little confused before whimpering like a hurt animal. We decided to drag him back to a tent outside town and let him calm down there, but not before he made a decision looking at those forges. Ogi will become dwarf. The next few sessions were filled with a mix of heartache and heartwarming. Ogi tried extra hard to make better armor, and Raj now found a full-time hobby teaching Ogi to read dwarvish. Every now and again, Ogi's efforts paid off, and his armor would be as good if not slightly above what we were wearing, but it still was terribly filled and barely held together. Just a result of something so big not having the dexterity to make the fine-tuning of professionally crafted armor. Every now and then, Ogi would ask the group, specifically Raj, how he was doing. Ogi Dwarf no? Not yet, I don't think. Maybe you try harder. Ogi can do. Ogi seemed to become more determined every day, clinging away at his magic forge. Combining what little scrap we found for him to throw together, he also began asking Lucas for help with our contacting Moradin to become a dwarf. We tried doing what we could in our spare time, but we also had to focus on the BBEG of the setting, since we didn't want to derail the whole thing for our DM, who had been a pretty chilled dude up to this point about the whole thing. We told Ugi that we had to fight a big bad guy, and that we needed to focus on saving the world. Ogi seemed to understand and asked for a little bit of metal, promising to stop asking if we got it for him. We relented and turned over the last pieces of metal for him in exchange for him helping us on the quest. The DM told us that Ogi isn't designed for the combat levels we were at by this point, but he could help a little if we were careful. Worst case scenario, we pull him back, Lucas performs, lay on hands, and we're good. We slowly uncovered a conspiracy that ties to an ancient forgotten god one who was worshipped up as the god of destruction and undoing. Pretty sweet stuff as we kept getting closer and closer. The armor from Ogi stopped showing up, but it was okay. We found cheap armor. We made an effort to save the pieces that Ogi had crafted for us. Out of loyalty to our curious big crafty smith friend, Ogi never seemed to ask for metal anymore. 
but we heard him clanking away every night before we would fall asleep. The lessons continued with Raj teaching Ogi more and more about Mordid, but he couldn't answer the most spiritual of them, only being a warrior who happened to be a dwarf. With the questions about the gods' methods, Lucas was there to answer his questions. How Ogi talk to Mordid? You pray and ask for guidance. Mordid show Ogi how to make better armor. If he sees fit to, he shall guide you. How Ogi know? You won't, but you have to believe. Ogi believe. After a while, Ogi began splitting the time between speaking with Lucas about Morden, which he thought was the quickest way to becoming a dwarf, and practicing his rudimentary dwarvish, which he used to read his first book. He faded more and more into our group's project, a background character. We still cared for him, but we just couldn't afford to babysit him as we leveled up. He also insisted on having Lucas ask Morden if he was a dwarf yet. More than make Ogi dwarf now? That is not my place to tell Ogi. Ogi pray, but more than not talking. Did Ogi do it wrong? It is not my place to tell, but I believe the gods work in mysterious ways. Ogi understand. Make better armor soon for friends. As we cleared out more and more dungeons, we started to realize that we had made a mistake dragging Ogi along. He just couldn't keep up to our leveling, and he couldn't get any useful perks. He started to become a hassle. By the time we were at the final stretch of this quest, facing the ancient cult summoning the god, we had a silent agreement to leave Ogi behind, lest he get hurt. We executed the plan perfectly. The last town before the invasion, we told Ogi to stay with the Magic Forge and practice alone for a few days, and that we were going to get him more metal to work with. Of course, the big lug agreed, and after casting a spell to keep the fires going for a week, we set out. Ogi clinging away happily. We didn't look back, but you can be damn sure we didn't leave with a smile. Two hours into the dungeon and we knew we had messed up. First off, we failed one too many sneak and bluffs, and that meant the cultists had finished their mission in summoning the God of Undoing. He was essentially an Orcus without the secrecy. Pragmatic as hell, he immediately begins to cast a bunch of seals and spells that trap us in the room and then debuffs our armor to the point it's unraveling back into scrap. Our warlock was protecting our wizard with a low-level demon. Our rogue was deathly trying to pickpocket the dead cultists for anything that might help. Raj and Lucas led the attack, and I was firing a volley every chance I got, rolling for anything that might break his ungodly armor. We were using everything, and we had run out of potions. Lucas had no more lay on hands available thanks to a dozen cultists cutting off his prayers to Bahamut. It was only now that we regretted not having a cleric. The god approached Lucas and Raj without a hint of a monologue proceeds to wreck their shit. He breaks Raj's armor, shatters the divine shield Lucas was using, and then readies his next round of spells. And then, the DM rolled for initiative. From behind me, a large metal spear flew out and thumped the god. Not enough to hurt him, but it was high enough to roll to disrupt his spell. Ogi done crafting. From behind us, standing in the large doorway, stood an ogre, clad in a terribly mismatched set of armor, emblazoned with a hammer of Mordan on its chest piece. In his right hand, an enormous hammer the size of a stone column, and made of the same dented metal. Suddenly, all the knights of clinging made sense. Ogi wanted to help, and we just thought he was a burden. Ogi charged forward, rolling a 17 on his first roll, and with the god suffering from his stupefaction because of his, of his entrance, landed his first hit. It was the most damaging hit we had done to the god, and it had been dealt by an ogre that was wearing what looked like the rejected arts and crafts project of a preschooler. We sat there for a moment in stunned silence as the DM described the armor and hammer he carried, calling it a crude mimicry of the holy hammers and suits of armor worn by the paladins of Morden. You no know hurt, clang. Ogie's friends, clang. No more, clang. Three hits, each one doing a little less than the last, but still doing something. During this affair, the rogue finally hit a natural 20 and found the cultist leader's emergency regans to shut the whole spell down on his corpse. She rolled for the toss to Lucas, who had enough armor to take another hit if he needed to get close. Ogi roared and attempted to grapple, using its natural modifiers to hold him, a god of destruction, for a brief moment. Ogi paladin now! Do help more than help Lucas like real dwarf! We felt a pang of guilt. 
We had left this guy behind so he couldn't bother us with his quest to becoming a dwarf, but here he was, wearing that stupid smile, wearing that stupid armor, and pulling that stupid move. Lucas sighed heavily and we all rolled for our respective abilities. There was a brief moment where we thought that we had this thing down, until Lucas and our warlock stopped and realized the flaw in the plan. Ogi still is in high level. With that, our turn ended and the DM rolled for the gods' attack versus Ogi's grapple. I wish I could say Ogi had a natural 20. I wish I could say that his modifier gave him enough to hold the god down, but I can't. The god rolled 14. Ogi rolled 5. The DM then informed us that not only did the god break the grapple, but now had stunned Ogi long enough to cast a spell of destruction, point blank, at Ogi's chest. As I said before, very rarely did Ogi craft armor that matched the level stats of armor we bought in town. He was wearing armor that was almost two levels below his current level, and his current level was lower than any of us. Ogi collapsed in a heap, and then the god turned to face us. For those that don't know, our warlock was once that guy. He had a major falling out with the demon Lucas, and reformed himself. He never got along with Lucas, but was willing to not be a jerk as long as Lucas didn't call him out on stuff again. This was the only time I saw our warlock look across the table and ask Lucas for help. I need a favor, and I need it now. Lucas moved to cover the warlock who charged forward with a series of demons in tow. Our warlock may have been a jerk a tad, but he was a jerk with a good amount of demons on call for favors. He called every single one of them. The DM, knowing what this meant to us, didn't bother to ask for our rolls. Every demon snuck in a hit, and with a dwarf at his heels, a wizard freezing his balls, and a ranger firing arrows into every square inch of flesh exposed on his hide, it was no wonder the god never saw our rogue behind him with the sealing amulet and scroll of desolation from the cultist leader. Before the god even returned to the astral plane, we rushed to Ogi, who was managing to hang on by the merest thread of life possible. Lay on hands was next to useless, and with no potions, we all knew what we were watching. We were watching Ogi die, and even after we had killed a god, conquered dungeons, and leveled evil kingdoms, we couldn't even save our friend. Ogi, sorry he got in way. You didn't. He did great. Ogi, sorry he did not make good armor like Dwarf. We love your armor, big guy. Don't talk like that. I never seen Lucas try so hard to call in a favor from Bahamut, or roll so desperately for a miracle. Even though the warlock was searching his sheets for a demon who might help without too hefty a price, no, no avail. Ogi, no why more than no talk to Ogi. Ogi hands too big and clumsy. Do Ogi not make small armor nice and pretty? It's fine, Ogi. Just hang on. We're going to save you. Ogi knew he not good Gratty Smith when he saw Dwarf Temple. A Gratty Smith look at him funny. But Ogi try anyway. I'm a touchy-feely guy, and I know Ogi was a figment of our imagination. But when you see Lucas, a veteran who lost his left leg to a bomb before he was 25, holding back tears, you know it wasn't just me being blubbery when I say that we were tearing up. Ogi not good crafty smith with armor and weapons. But Ogi good crafty smith at something. Ogi can make good story. At this point, our rogue hid behind our screen, and the warlock just stared down at his sheep having stopped searching for his demon to deal with. Ogi think dwarves make good armor and stories, which why Ogi wanted to be dwarf. But Ogi understand he not dwarf, and he not be dwarf ever. Ogi's breathing began to slow, and Raj grabbed his hand, holding it as best he could. You could be a dwarf, Ogi. You could be the best ogre dwarf in the land. Ogi closed his eyes and smiled. Ogi like that. You go sleep now. Like that, our party lost Ogi, the crafty smith, and we all think a little something died with him inside all of us. We looted the dungeon, killed the remaining cultists, and made our way back to the nearest village, one that happened to have a temple and forge for followers of Morden. When we entered the town, we all took notice that the forges were louder than ever, and half the town seemed to be gathered around the temple. Naturally curious, we moved closer. At first, we were willing to push through, until Lucas used a favor from Bahamut to project a holy shout and clear the path. We got closer and closer to the entrance. We saw more and more dwarves, some wearing the emblem of Morden, others in the attire of his sacred blacksmiths. As we reached the entrance, knowing we weren't allowed in, we asked a priest if he could tell us what the fuss was. 
The priest asked us if we had been involved with the destruction of a god of undoing. Of course, we were, so he led us inside. Deep inside the mountain, past the pillars and past the gorgeously carved hallways and stone arches, and into the deepest parts of the forge's sanctums. We witnessed dozens of dwarves mill around, throwing around orders and commands in ancient dwarvish. The priest pointed to what had been causing the ruckus. We received divine word that morning. The creator has ordered a statue to be erected to honor the fall of the god. The dwarves tugged out a large metal and marble statue from a crafting vault. And the appointment of a new apprentice to his mighty forges in the halls of his domain. There, crafted by the finest dwarven artisans, was an enormous thirty-foot-tall statue of Ogi, complete with a golden hammer and silver book of dwarven crafting, and a beard befitting a dwarf. Ogi, good crafter, honorary dwarf of Mordor, and crafty smith of the forge. That was the first time I cried playing D&D. After a year of sessions in D&D, I elected to have my hero, the half-elven ranger, retire into godhood as a deity of honorable hunting. Upon ascension, I asked for a favor. As great as my weapons were in the mortal realms, the fact was that I needed something more suited for godly duties. So they needed to be reworked, and I knew exactly who I wanted to remake them. Morden welcomed me into his forge, obviously happy to have his apprentice practice with their skills in crafting goods fit for gods. When I asked if it could be possible to have someone specific work on it, he knew exactly who I wanted and led me to a grand hall where dozens of dwarves were gathered around a large figure clanging ha away happily at an anvil. There, wearing his iconic slapdash armor over an enormously enlarged dwarf robe, was Ogi wearing the biggest, dumbest smile you could ever imagine. He looked up, smiled, picked me up, laughing and hugging as I tried not to cry. When he finally put me down, I showed him what I had wanted to show him ever since he left our group. I held up my hands and showed him what I was wearing for celestial armor. There, on my hands, were Ovi's worsty good gloves, battered from years of use and adventures, and raised to the levels of a god's armor. And that is the story of Ogi, the honorary dwarf and crafty smith of the forge. And with that said and done, I'm Looney, this is Dark Imagination, and that was the story of Ogi, the honorary dwarf. It was quite the read, and it honestly made me tear up a bit the first time I read through it. I'm looking forward to more amazing stories to read to you guys, and I'll see you guys next time.